This is a story I never thought I'd be telling. On February 19, 1942, President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which authorized the internment of tens of thousands of Americans of Japanese descent, as well as resident aliens from Japan. For me, I have a personal connection with this because my grandfather was Japanese, um, Japanese American. He was born in Hawaii and he ended up serving in the US Army during World War II. And because his family was Japanese, of course, several members of his family were affected by uh, not only the internment camps, but one of them even served in the infamous 442nd. So anyway, I've been doing a lot of research on the internment of Japanese Americans and uh, residential aliens from Japan. Um, this has been a big thing for me for several years, ever since I found out about it. And for me, this has been a very personal journey. And usually I keep this chapter of my life, as well as my paranormal life, two separate things. But then I found something that I actually kind of brought it all together. But first, before we get started, take a moment to subscribe to my channel and also give this video a like. And if you have a moment, feel free to visit my website, alexmatsuo.com, or find me on Facebook and friend me on Facebook, or like my Facebook page. I really enjoy hearing from people and talking to you about spooky stuff, singing stuff, basically almost anything under the sun. All right, let's get started. So the title of the video is a bit misleading, but I wanted to use a term that was familiar to people. So I ran into pretty much a report on a ghost hunt or a paranormal investigation at an assembly center for uh, for the internment camps. So the assembly center was where um, folks of Japanese descent gathered together where, where they were waiting to be processed and being sent to one of the bigger internment camps. Oftentimes these assembly centers were put together rather quickly and for the assembly center in our story, Tanfaran, it was a racetrack in San Bruno, California, so located around the Bay Area. So I have to let you know how I ran into this story. Originally, I was trying to find vintage ghost stories, so I love ghost stories from like the early 1900s. Late 1800s, early 1900s, especially around that golden age of Hollywood, you know, when the talkies were coming out and... There was a lot of glitz and glam of Hollywood, so I went on to the website for the Library of Congress. They have a wealth of information as well as old newspaper articles. Um, it's a great gold mine of information. And so I just typed in Hollywood and ghosts. That's what I was looking for. I was looking for Hollywood ghosts or reported hauntings in Hollywood. I found something. I found like this screenshot of an article. Immediately I saw the headline and I was like, Okay, that's interesting, but it was funny because I initially found like a ghost story found in the Hollywood Bowl, and I'm like, huh, okay. Seems a little odd, but I'll go for it. It's a little later than what I was hoping to find, but I'm like, eh, we'll give it a try. But then I saw the article was talking about um, uh, apartments in the Hollywood Bowl, and of course that's what drove me to look at the title of the newspaper, and that's when I'm like, what? So the name of the newspaper was the Tanferen Totalizer. And when I immediately saw that, I knew that it was one of the 15 newspapers that circulated around the assembly centers. Reading these newspapers has been a very enlightening experience when it came to knowing more about the life of Japanese Americans um, in the internment camps. So this is an often forgotten piece of, of American history. Uh, a lot of people still don't know that tens of thousands of Japanese Americans and resident aliens from Japan were sent to these internment camps. So I tend to do a lot of uh, research in this area because it's, it's so not well known. And for me, especially since I have family connections with the internment camps, this has been something I've been really wanting to know about. So that's how I knew what the Tamper and Totalizer was right off the bat. And again, I've always seen these two parts of my life, the paranormal life and, you know, my research into, you know, the Japanese American internment camps. They were two separate things. I never even thought or fathomed to put them together, uh, mainly because of the respect factor, because I had been asked, like, you know, would you ever go to Manzanar and do a ghost hunt? Absolutely not. It's on the same level of would you go to Auschwitz and do a, a ghost hunt? No. 
<laughs> there's just some things you don't touch. And for me, because I have such a close family tie to this area, I really didn't want to bring any disrespect, um, especially for my family and, um, as, you know, and my cousins who are direct descendants from the those who were interned. And again, like I mentioned, my grandfather was serving in the U.S. Army during this time, so he actually didn't go to the internment camps. His first wife was in an internment camp, um, and as well as his brother, one of his brothers was sent to a prison camp because uh, he was caught snorkeling off the coast of San Francisco, and he was accused of being a spy for Japan. And um, his brother, another brother of his, he had several siblings, another brother of his actually served in the 442nd as a medic. And the other thing, uh, my grandfather was actually studying, uh, I want to say it was aeronautical engineering. He was studying something at the University of Washington, and after Pearl Harbor happened, he was kicked out of school. He did get an honorary degree uh, several decades later, I want to say, 2010-ish, early 2000s. I would have to ask my uncle, but uh, my grandfather died in 1992, so he actually never got that honorary degree in his lifetime. I'm getting off track here, so let's go back to the ghost story. So I mentioned the Tamferin Assembly Center was located in San Bruno, California, close to the Bay Area, pretty close to San Francisco, and it was a thoroughbred horse track from 1899 to 1964 and the assembly center opened in April of 1942. And again, it was a temporary detention center where about 8,000 Japanese Americans were processed and stayed there until they were sent over to the internment camps where they ended up living for years. And these families lost everything. I mean, they were forced, a lot of them were forced to sell their businesses. They had to leave their pets behind. They could only take what they could carry, if that. And if you had children, especially small children or babies, I mean, you couldn't really carry a lot. And so during their temporary stay at Tanferin, they were actually living in horse stalls. And there were uh, temporary barracks that were built as well, very quickly. So we're not talking like they were staying at a hotel or even like a Motel 6 or even that sketchy motel on the corner, you know, in the sketchy area of town. They were living in really close quarters. I mean, think about how big a horse stall is. And many of these people had families, so there was like three or four. And some of these stalls even had multiple families. So you're talking like several people, maybe even as more than a dozen, living in really tight closed quarters. So to give you an idea of what tight of a capacity that Tanferin was deal dealing with, so the first woman uh, who was a Japanese American to get a medical degree, Dr. Kazue Togasaki, she delivered more than 50 babies at at the assembly center in a month. 50 babies born in a month. That's crazy. That's insane. Now, the Tamferin Totalizer was first published in May of 1942. It was edited by Taro Katayama, and it actually published about, I want to say, 19 weekly uh, editions. So, when I found this article, um, it's it was titled Ghosts of Tanferin, and it had a little cute illustration of a ghost on it. Okay, so I assume this is what I was looking for. The article was published on July 11th, 1942, and the article noted that the incident in question happened on July 8th of 1942. Now, in the article, the Tanferin Totalizer, the writer talked about apartments, which, of course, we know the real Hollywood Bowl doesn't have apartments, but the Hollywood Bowl itself, um, that was where, like, you know, people were living, so the racetrack kind of looked like a bowl, in a sense, and... So the ghost story happened in apartment 22. So apparently there was a mob of people surrounding apartment 22 and there was this rumor floating around that there was a ghost, a blue ghost haunting the apartment. And the blue ghost only appeared when the room was dimmed or it was completely dark. And it terrified the family living there so much that they actually ended up going to stay with another friend in a different apartment. And this was the family of James Fujitas. I actually kind of laughed when I read the quote uh, from the family. So they, they basically said, why should we stay in our apartment with that blue thing up in there? I mean, <laughs> today's hauntings, you know, when people are dealing with hauntings and ghosts in their home you know they they want to leave and they don't really have that choice but because of the situation that the Fujitas family was going through at the time they did have an option to switch apartments or stay with a friend for a bit so then that was also the moment I realized we were dealing with a paranormal investigation a residential investigation at a, a Japanese internment camp or an assembly center for a Japanese internment camp 
I mean, it's got, when you go through the list, it's got all the things. The family's experiencing something they've never seen or heard before. They're terrified by it. They're seeing something. They're seeing what they believe is an apparition. And they want to get out. They want to get rid of it. And before anyone gets too judgy about this, I mean, keep in mind, these families were just uprooted from their homes. Um, they lost everything. They're living in not only unfamiliar conditions, but also really poor conditions. I mean, we're talking bed bugs. Uh, sanitation is just, is just not a thing. Um, and they're living all in close quarters together. I mean, they're going through some stress. So I think to freak out like this is totally valid. This next part actually really amuses me. So in, in terms of like the paranormal thing. So the what was happening in the Fujita's apartment caught, um, caught the attention of some skeptics that also lived in the internment camp. So they decided, hey, let's check this out. So the group of skeptics examined the room and they had determined that a piece of wood in the ceiling had rotted and that rot was giving off a phosphorescent light, which would only be seen in the dark. So the skeptics, they decided to cover the spot and the case was solved. Or at least they thought it was. So Mr. Fujitas decided to stay one more night as, at his friends, but around 11.30 p.m. he wanted to go grab some clothes. So he went back to his apartment, apartment 22, and he goes inside, and what does he see? He sees the blue ghost. Again. After that spot had been covered by the, on the ceiling. So Mr. Fujitas rightfully freaked out. He goes to the apartment of his friend Bob Iki, uh, which was apartment 33, and he also got another friend to accompany him, uh, and this person had the last name of Satao. Uh, the article didn't actually give this person's first name, so we're gonna call them Satao. So they all went back to apartment 22, and what do you know, that blue ghost was back, or at least the ghost in the form of a light. This actually wasn't like a ghost in terms of like an apparition of a person, but it was a blue light, which they called a ghost. So the three men, went into the room, they closed the door behind them, and they let their eyes adjust to the light. And amazingly enough, they saw that the light was coming from a crack in the wall. So what's interesting is, is one, the skeptics didn't catch this, but I'm also thinking that the skeptics didn't stay in the apartment uh, long enough for their eyes to really adjust to the change in the light. So I think that's why they might have missed the crack in the wall um, and just assumed that it was coming from ceiling rot. So Mr. Fujitas, Mr. Iki, and Mr. Satao, they ended up covering the crack in the wall. And wouldn't you know it, the blue ghost was never seen again. So I find this story really amazing. And I have to wonder, you know, as these families, the Fujitas family, the Iki family, the Satao family, as they moved on to the next process of their interment, I have to wonder if maybe the story may have stuck with them for a little bit. And I also have to wonder if these families may have appreciated this distraction because they were really going through a terrible time in their life. And I would hope that maybe uh, this blue ghost was that temporary distraction that they needed to maybe help them keep their sanity a bit. And was this an experience that stuck with them for the rest of their lives or was it eventually forgotten? I mean, I have never heard of any sort of story like this and I truly believe that had I not found that article um, on the Library of Congress's website, I, I don't know when that story would have come to light. I mean, was the story eventually just lost to the wind? Just like all of the stories of, of these folks who were interned in these camps. Um, I mean, I know for me, my grandfather never spoke about it. He never talked about this chapter of his life, at least not to me. He didn't talk about it with my mom. Um, many of these people just sort of, uh, you know, held it together and just kept pushing forward, um, you know, moving forward with pride and, you know, their dignity and respect. Gaman. So if you do return to the Tamferin racetrack today, you're going to see that it was turned into a shopping center. And you won't be able to tell that there was ever an assembly center there. The only thing that will tell you that something had happened there is this little rock garden with a commemorative plaque saying, hey, this was an assembly center for Japanese Americans and those of Japanese descent. That's the only thing left there that honors those who were imprisoned there. And I'm hoping at the very least, this story has managed to find its way from the darkness and into the light. So whether you read this on my blog or you're watching this video now, I hope that you will keep the story in your minds and in your hearts and feel free to share it. Please, please, please share it because I feel like 
this is an important story, not just for our paranormal aspect, but also for, you know, American history. Maybe that that blue light wasn't a ghost, but it gives us a glimpse of what life was like for those in limbo when they had to leave everything that they knew behind and they were moving forward with a new chapter in their lives that was really ambiguous and quite terrifying. And for me, this is a story that will stay in my heart for the rest of my life. So thank you again for watching and feel free to leave a comment. Let me know what you thought of this video and stay tuned for more videos coming in the future. And thank you all again, be well, and I'll see you next time.